Well, good morning, church. Hasn't the Lord given great gifts to this church? I mean, this amazing choir, our worship leader, our interim missions director, Paul Harker Road, didn't he do a great job with announcements? I mean, the most reluctant guy in the building to want to come up here and do that, and yet he did. Beautiful job. And he mentioned fasting and solitude. So that's not a bad thing to do. So if you want to come up here Wednesday evening and fast and spend time in solitude with the Lord, come on. Love to see you on campus. Hey, this morning we're going to be in Psalm 50. So if you have a Bible, open your Bible to Psalm 50. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the back of the pews. And if you don't own a Bible, that's our gift to you. So Psalm 50, go ahead and make your way there. And I want to ask you a question. Are there any fans of reality television in the audience? Anybody that likes reality television? Be honest. Me, not so much. Because I think the reality television shows are really kind of scripted so that they're entertaining. I'll tell you, if they did a reality show about my life, because I'm boring, no one would want to watch it. I can't imagine people watching any reality show about Gary Cook. Honestly, though, I've seen a few. Okay, I'll just be quite honest. I mean, Undercover Boss. I'm not a binge watcher, but I've seen Undercover Boss. I've seen, uh, I've seen um, Shark Tank. I've seen some cookie competitions because they're popular in my household. But that's kind of ironic because I'm not an entrepreneur like people on Shark Tank. And my last name's Cook, but in the kitchen, it's really simple stuff for me. I'm not really a cook either. But there's this one show called Undercover Boss I mentioned. One show, Undercover Boss. Do you know that show? So the premise, as I understand it, is that a business owner disguises himself as a regular employee and goes and works alongside the other employees. They don't know who he or she is. And what he wants to do is see what's happening behind the scenes and see what his people truly think about him. And the climax is the boss revealing themselves to these employees and telling the employees what he or she saw as their boss. Now let's think for a moment about our lives because we're unscripted, we're untelevised. Uh, We don't, you know, we don't uh, uh, have these scripted and televised lives as a church body. We um, We simply come here once a week to worship or maybe twice a week, maybe more than that spend a few hours here in prayer, spend a few hours in worship, spend a few hours singing, spend a few hours listening, spend a few hours fellowshipping, and then we leave and we go back to our daily lives. Have you ever stopped to consider that, though we can't see him, that God is always watching us? Always. He knows exactly what we're doing every moment of every day. And at any moment, the Lord could step in and evaluate us as a church. Um, He could step in and say, here's what I see. Do you know why he'd be looking? And do you know what he'd be looking for in us? Here's what I think. Here's what I believe. The church, the church worldwide, every local church, This local church should be focused on Christ-centered worship and on God's word. Those two things. That's what God is looking for. That's the church the Father uses by his spirit to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Am I right? Well, Psalm 50 describes a particular time where God is looking at his church. And he's not just watching, not just inspecting, but in Psalm 50, he's judging his people. The judge announces his visit. The judge assembles his people. And then the judge articulates his two main grievances against his people. Stand up. Everybody stand up, and we're going to hear the word of the Lord in Psalm 50. 
It's a psalm of Asaph. The mighty one, God the Lord has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. May our God come and not be silent. Fire devours him. And a storm is violently raging around him. He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to him, the Most High. Call upon me in a day of trouble and I shall rescue you and you will honor me. But to the wicked, God says, what right do you have to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? For you yourself hate discipline and you throw my words behind you. When you see a thief, you become friends with him and you associate with adulterers. You let your mouth loose in evil and your tongue harnesses deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son these things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. I will rebuke you and present the case before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you in pieces, and there will be none to deliver. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning, as we hear your word, as we see this time of judgment and grace, Father, I pray that we might use this time to let you examine us as a church that we might conform to what you desire of us. Father, I pray that for everyone in this room and for us as a body, in Christ's name, amen. Well, unlike the Psalms of the last three weeks where we were very specifically looking at times in, in history, times in David's life, it was very clear in the Psalms, we don't have that historical context here. It's a Psalm of Asaph. We don't know the specific events that brought about this examination by God of his people. And we don't know the specific time or the context in the Old Testament narrative, but we do know this. The author is Asaph. Asaph is a lead singer, a leader of choir worship. Uh, he's like Pastor Mark, right? A worship pastor. And he's under King David, and he's noted in, in First Chronicles as at the time when uh, the ark was brought back to Jerusalem. So that's where you first hear his name in the scriptures. He authored about 11 other psalms, Psalms 73 through 83, or Psalms of Asaph. And he usually wrote troubling songs, psalms. They, are, um, they talk about disobedience. They talk about wickedness. They talk about God's enemies against his people. And he was a symbolist. He loved symbols. I can imagine through this psalm, the symbols crashing. We have a few other clues about this psalm. The people that are, the accused that are going to be in God's courtroom is the people of Israel, God's people. 
They were living under a covenant relationship. Uh, Pastor Mark talked about this a bit. So they're under this covenant relationship with God where they bring sacrifices when they come to worship. We don't do that in the way they did animals that they bring. And they had that practice of worship. They'd agreed to the covenant with God. They'd said, yes, we will. you will be our God and we will obey you. We will live as you tell us to. And they had a knowledge of God's commandments, God's word. It wasn't just a, we're not sure what you're saying, but they knew his word. Within that broad context, this is either a past event that Asaph's writing about so as people can sing it, or it's a possibility or maybe a prophecy, but it gives a chilling description of this visit by God as judge. And so Psalm 50 begins, and we're going to put ourselves for these next few minutes in this courtroom along with the people of Israel. What if the judge were coming here to First Baptist Church, Bernie? What would he find? So as we walk through this, let's be thinking about that. And it begins with the judge's arrival, and it's huge. Listen, starting in verse 1, the mighty one, God the Lord, the mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting, from the east to the west. So God's announced as a sovereign one, and he's calling all to be witnesses in his courtroom as it begins. What will they see? Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. God is radiant. God is holy. God is light. He's pure and he's perfect. And his heavenly city reflects that. And the city of Zion, Jerusalem, the temple where the ark is, is to reflect that as well. That's what it's supposed to look like. Holy and pure. And then verse 3, it says, May God come and not keep silent. Fire devours before him, and a storm is violently raging around him. Think about that description. Fire, a consuming fire. Storm, a violent storm. When these show up, it doesn't mean happy birthday. Good job. The Calvary's here. Hey, great, dinner's ready. Nope, this is not a calm and serene setting at all. Not a good setting at all. This is a scary scene. This is a uh-oh, serious moment for God's people. Verse four, he summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Judge. There it is. Judge. With all the servants in heaven, with all of creation called to fill up the courtroom, then God speaks. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. God's not judging the entire world. God's judging a particular people, the people that he chose through the line of Abraham, the people that he redeemed from from imprisonment under the Egyptians, the people that he brought to a promised land that became their land to possess. And people that made a covenant promise to him They're warned by Joshua. No, you can't keep it. No, we will. We will. This is our Lord, and we will keep our covenant with him. And then verse six, the heavens declare his righteousness, his fairness, his ability to judge, for God himself is judge. As a parent, or as a boss, or as a teacher, You have to be able to evaluate and judge people. But you may feel like you're not really worthy because you've done the same things they have. You've committed crimes before. You've maybe in the present are doing things. You might want to say, uh, don't do as I do, do as I say. Because that's all you can do. But not God. Not God. His judgment is fair. It's flawless. It's holy. He's holy. He wrote the rules. No one, no one can question God's judgment. And so even before the trial begins, even before he presents his grievances against his people, 
Asaph quiets him down with this statement. Asaph quiets the crowd, quiets the accused. And there's the breathing mark before it begins, Selah. Well, the first accusation is worship. God's going to give a judgment on how they worship him. And he says, it's hollow and it's hypocritical. It centers around sacrifices because when they go to worship God, unlike we do, so they'll bring an animal for sacrifice. If they've committed sins, they'll bring an animal for that. If they've come to bring to, uh, to, uh, uh, to recognize the vows they made to him, they'll bring it for that. If they come to give him a free will offering, God, we just, they'll bring it for that. Um, if they come to the feast, they'll bring it for that. And so God acknowledges that. So God says, hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I don't reprove you for your sacrifices. And your burnt offerings are continually before me. He's saying, I recognize that you are bringing the sacrifices, the right sacrifices at the right times. I don't have a problem with that at all. You're bringing them. They're continually around me. I see it. But then, listen to this. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills, there it is. That statement that we often say when we pray, cattle on, yes, there it is. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? What he's saying is the people of Israel are confused about their relationship with him. Even though they're bringing these sacrifices, he says, I don't need them. Does God need the animals that are being sacrificed to him? Nope. I'm not coming after your flocks. I own everything, even your flocks. I'm not hungry, waiting for you to bring something to me. What really happened what his accusation is, is that the people of Israel have forgotten or they've gotten, let's, let me say it nicely, they've gotten confused about their relationship with God. They made it transactional. I bring you something and you do something for me. We bring a sacrifice to you, God, and you make me prosperous, just like you promised. We bring a sacrifice to you, God, and you take care of our problems, our health, our crops, our enemies, because this is our land, and you are the God that serves us. So we've, or I've, brought you something. Now do things the way that we, or I, want them, or need them to be done. That's how Israel's thinking about worship to God. It's really the other way around. In his kindness, the judge, the mighty God, reminds him of what the relationship is supposed to be. Listen to the verdict. Here's verse 14. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. That word is todah. I'll explain that in just a minute. And pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you, and you will honor me. He reminds them to be faithful to the allegiance that they made to him. The transactional sacrifices, they aren't evidence of their allegiance. The sacrifices at the feast, on the day of atonement, when they're acknowledging the vows they've made, they're supposed to be a remembrance to be thankful. That word todah that Asaph uses, that's a song of thanksgiving and praise. That's what God wants from us. That's what God deserves from us. 
Not that he needs that from us, but our response to him should be thanksgiving, remembering what God has done, remembering all the things that God has done for his people. He reminds them to be thankful for deliverance from trouble. The creator of the universe knows everything about you, everything about us, at every single moment. The father who can assemble and delegate everything in an instance, what did he do for us? He sent his only son for us to save us from our sins. What's our response? Thank you, Lord. Because I was lost. We were lost. And now we're saved. Thank you, Lord, because we were enemies of yours. And now no longer. <coughs> Do you think he needs our attendance at church? Needs our attendance at church? Do you think he needs you to tell him how he should be working in his kingdom? Let's give him instructions on how things should be done. Whenever someone gets up and leaves and says, things aren't working here the way that I want them to work, or the way we want them to work, I'm out. Do you realize you're saying that to the Lord God who formed the body of the local church every place it is around the world? If he's looking, which he is, I hope he sees that we're here to worship him. I hope he sees we're here to bring him glory to show everyone with us and everyone around us that this is God's house, the Son's church, a spirit-filled people who are continually thankful for what he's done and always doing. And we want needy, broken, lost people to come and to come into a relationship with our God. And everything we do as a church is about this. Worship in spirit by bringing thanksgiving for what God has done. Well, the judge isn't done. He's got one more grievance against the people, and it's this. It's judgment of their wordship, their truth. Here's what verse 16 says, but the, to the wicked, God says, what right do you have to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth. For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. You throw them away. Here's what that means. It's great irony. These wicked people are, it's clear that God's words, his commandments and the particulars of the covenant he made with them, they already know them. They know what they are. They can recite them. They can say them. They're being spoken by the people, but they're a wicked people. And here's the evidence. Here's the surprising, troubling, and completely ridiculous truth. The very people who can so easily recite God's words, recount the agreements and the responsibilities of his covenant with them, they hate these words. They say them, but they don't do them. So now having judged Israel for its hollow and hypocritical worship, he judged them for their hollow and hypocritical Bible knowledge. Isn't that ironic? Here's the evidence. When you see a thief, you're pleased with him, and you associate with adulterers, stealing and adultery. They know it's against God's law, but they do it. You let your mouth loose in evil and your tongues frame deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son, speaking evil words, tricking people with words for your own gain, slandering others. Even your own mother's son, you hate him. You're disintegrating the house and the household of God by your words. Is that in the Bible? Is that what the Bible tells us to do? Absolutely not. The Lord says, these things you have done and I kept silent. You thought I was just like you because you're doing these things and I didn't say anything. 
you're doing these things and I didn't bring it to your attention. You think that God doesn't notice. You think he's not watching. You think God allows this behavior. You think God permits you to do exactly what he doesn't say in his word. His word's really not true. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Church, this is a very sobering thought. For those who preach the word, for those who teach the word, for those who hear the word, in the worshiping fellowship, in growth groups, in Bible study, or in other gatherings, and even in your home where the word is there. This psalm from God's word, from the mighty Lord God, our Redeemer, asks us this very question. You may know my words, but do you believe them? Because if you believe them, you'd be doing them. The verdict for disbelief in God's word is evidenced by how they live, by a living rejection of God's word. And the judgment, the verdict is very severe. Listen, and remember, God has been patient. His silence has been his patience. Verse 22, now consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you in pieces, and there will be none to deliver. If you cry out to me, I won't hear you. <sighs> That's scary. Before you freak out about this, before you worry about this, because if you think, man, I'm not living the way God's word says, think about what's been preached from the Psalms these past three weeks about David's life. How David confessed his sin. David confronted with his sin, confessed it. There's a huge difference. See, we're still sinners. We still sin, don't we? But there's a huge difference between those who use the word and twist God's word for their own gain and their own deceit, those false teachers who only want profit from knowing God's word and preaching God's word and speaking God's word, and those who say, I'm saved, that's enough. I don't need anything else. I don't need to do anything else in my life. I'm already saved by Jesus Christ, and their ears are closed off. What do they need? They just simply need repentance. They need us to be alongside them. They need to be taught to hear from the Spirit. And then there's those who are sinners, saved by grace, through faith, who know their own sin, who desire not to sin, and plea to God for help. So here's the other half of the verdict. It is kindness. The judge, the mighty God, reminds him of what a right and vital relationship with God is all about. Listen to the other half. It's good news. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving, a song of thanksgiving for what God has done and who he is. Todah honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. I shall show my deliverance. What does the scripture say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He wants us to be righteous. We always have that opportunity to come to God and seek his help. And the big gift that he gave us is the Holy Spirit. Heeding the Holy Spirit when we read his word, heeding what the Holy Spirit says to us in his word, and knowing the Holy Spirit is at work in the church to not only forgive us of our sins, but to transform us more and more into God-honoring people. Isn't that right? He's talking to believers, saved by grace to faith. He reminds us to be faithful through obedience to him and thankful for his promise 
of deliverance. Thankful. If he's looking at us, which he is, I hope that we see that we are here to hear and live out his word. Didn't Jesus say that? Be just not hearers, but doers, right? To bring him glory in the teaching and our response to it. To show everyone with us and everyone around us that we are God's people, whatever we do and whatever we are, however we think and however we speak. To be God's house, the son's church, a spirit-filled people who are continually thankful for what God is doing in us, for what he's done and what he continues to do in us and through us. As I said before, we want needy, lost, broken people to come here and come into a relationship with God through hearing his word and seeing his people who believe it. Everything we do is about this. Worship in truth. Be a faithful people to God's word. Be a faithful people to God's word. I'll say this again, the church, the church worldwide, every local church, this local church should be focused on Christ-centered worship and faithfulness to God's word. That's what God's looking for. That's the church the Father uses by his Holy Spirit to reach the lost. Don't we want to see that? If you think this is a message that Asaph wrote just to the people in that day, the Israelites of the Old Testament, well, we'd be wrong. Um, the final book in the Bible, Revelation, reminds us that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is actively watching his church. Revelation 2 and 3 shows us where that happened, where he talks about the seven candlesticks, the seven churches, and Jesus speaks directly to them, knowing exactly who they are, what their character is, and what they need to hear. Everyone starts like this, right to the angel or the messenger of the church in this city. I, Jesus, know your character. I know your ways. I know what you're doing. I know what you need. Let anyone who has ears listen to what the Holy Spirit says to the churches and heed that. And he gave to his church the Holy Spirit. So that by the Spirit's work in us and through us, we will become true worshipers, worshipers in spirit and truth. Jesus said this, and it's happened. An hour is coming, this is from John 4, and is now here where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. With thanksgiving for what God is doing and with faithfulness to God's word. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him will worship in spirit and in truth. That's available here, now, today. Worship in spirit, bringing thankfulness for what God has done and what God is doing. Worship in truth, being faithful to God's word. Interesting about sanctification, I heard this from, uh, from one uh, teacher, Sanctification sometimes happens in church when you leave the car and come in the sanctuary and when you leave the sanctuary and go back to your car in the parking lot and that's as far as it goes. Our lives should not be like that. <laughs> we need God's word to go with us wherever we go and to come back for more. And that should be in your homes as well. The evidence witnessed by the judge here God is doing great things here. God is doing incredible things here. God's grace and mercy are so evident here in this church if you just look and see. Oh my gosh, great and amazing acts of his grace and mercy. We should be seeing them every single day. If, you're, if your eyes are open and your ears are open, you can see it. You can know it. We have great and amazing things to be thankful for. We can bring the Lord a, a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving every time we meet together. Amen? So let's offer him a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Let's pray together. 
Father, thank you for our salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that your son by his spirit is watching after us. Thank you that he wants his church right here on 631 South School Street in Bernie, Texas, to be seen as worshiping you in spirit and in truth. That we might be an instrument for the gospel, a light on a hill, evidence that draws the hopeless into a hope-filled, new, living, vital relationship with you, our Heavenly Father. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored here as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. Amen. I want to read one passage to you and I want us to respond in song. Here's from Colossians 3. 15 and 16, let the peace of Christ into which you are called in one body rule in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the message of Christ, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Worship and the word with thanksgiving and with gratitude. So one last song, no altar call, just together. I'm going to come down and sing with you. One last song. Let's sing this with gratitude. Let's sing this as a todah, a song of thanksgiving and praise to our God. Let's sing.